ones internally point to the mistakes of their partners using logic. But they usually don't say anything about these critiques. This tension can cause a long lasting, long time frustration and resentment since they can tend to repress their anger and are sometimes even unaware of it. This repression stems from the belief that they are, quote, bad when they experience anger instead of realizing conflict is part of life. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your Mystery Meat Sandwich. This is your mystery meat sandwich for the day. Different people see different similarities and similar differences by Nabokov. Different people see different similarities and similar differences. Okay, so when I first got married, my husband uh, said, we were talking about cars. He said, uh, yeah, so I was thinking we would just lease a car until we, and I was like, wait, wait, hold up, uh, lease a car. And he kind of looked at me like, yeah, and tried to continue on with his train of thought. And I stopped him again and I said, yeah, so just so you know, um, we don't lease cars here. I'm not really sure what you guys are doing down under, but uh, we just don't lease cars. And he kind of looked at me and he said, uh, so like what, you mean in America? Because you do lease cars here. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. I mean, like, my parents have told me that leasing cars is not a thing. And that was that was the deal. I was being truthful is that essentially when I was raised renting cars on vacation, no problem kind of thing. But you don't essentially rent a car for like three years. That was just not a thing. And I'm not super sure why. I don't know if it was for financial reasons. I don't know if it was because of the miles that you, you know, have to stay within. I'm not super sure what the actual reason was, but I was taught you do not lease cars. Basically, that's the biggest sin ever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm exaggerating, but we didn't lease cars. That was not a thing. So then when my husband explained to me why it would make financial sense for us, why it made sense because we could stay within the mileage and because our needs would change eventually when we started having kids. And all of that was true. And to this day, we still have a couple of cars that are leased and it does make sense for us. It makes complete sense for us. So it's just funny because that was the first time that I had this real turning point in that I realized, oh my gosh, first of all, I didn't even know why we didn't lease cars in my family. I didn't know why I had this belief system that I had about leasing cars. And then secondly, why I was so close-minded to leasing cars is just crazy to me that I didn't even take the time to hear him out. And I was just immediately just going to just write that off, write that whole idea off. That sort of was the first time I kind of realized, oh, so the world doesn't necessarily operate the way I operate. And it just, it sounds so bizarre that I hadn't realized it before that time. And I had in different areas, especially with the religion where I had grown up. And, um, but it just really dawned on me that people see the world differently through different lenses, from different perspectives. And, you know, it's different based on how we all grew up, our pasts, 
our religions, our demographics, our privilege or not privilege, all of these different factors help us formulate opinions and decisions. And, you know, we are not like everybody else that we bump into along life's path. And that is a wonderful thing, in my opinion, because it would be super boring if we did. So I started down this journey of realizing, huh, okay, so this is going to be different. We're, we're going to have differences in our marriage. Uh, we think differently. We have different stances on things. And, you know, it's like watching a car accident from two different angles. You're going to see things a little bit differently and describe them differently. Thus kind of became that journey for me of walking down a pathway throughout the rest of my life where I have now not assumed that everybody thinks the way I do. (laughs) And my thinking has changed. My curiosity level has increased exponentially. And I really love to know why people do the things that they do why they act the way they do, why they are motivated by some of the things that they're motivated by, particularly myself. You know, I'm very interested in my motives because I know that that's how I'm going to grow is when I look and really get to the root of why I'm doing what I'm doing or behaving the way I'm behaving or thinking the way I'm thinking. It's because looking at those motives helps me to have that acceptance and realization and admittance of, hmm, that motive was maybe a little bit shady, you know, if I'm being totally honest with myself. And so now I get to be empowered and have choices as to how I'm going to move forward in life. And, you know, it's very, it's very (laughs) mind-blowing. And very awakening because you know that's what I want to do. I want to grow and be a positive contributing member of society. That is one of my goals. And I can only do that by being brutally honest with myself. Brutally, brutally honest. And now on to the chaplain's chat. And so... Last episode, as I transition now into the chaplain's chat, last episode, I had everybody take a little quiz. And the quiz was about the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is a personality test, basically. It's a relative, we should maybe say, of the Myers-Briggs. And it's about nine different personality types. Now, of course, this is not the end-all, be-all. Um, If you take an Enneagram test, it does not pigeonhole you. You're not put in a box and that's who you are forevermore. Probably as a child, I mean, I can already see different types that I might have been more closely linked to as a child than my current type. And that's all okay. That is kind of the nature of life and the journey of life and the twists and the turns. Um, But I think it's empowering to learn more about myself and my Enneagram type. And so we took a quiz that had essentially, it's a very high level quiz. It was only three questions with a few parts inside of those three major questions. And it was just to give a high level idea of the type that you might be, because you can definitely take Enneagram tests online and through coaches And through experts, neither of which I am, I just enjoy learning about the Enneagram. I am just a student of the Enneagram, not a teacher. And so I will just make that disclaimer right up front and also tell you that the information that I'm going to share in this podcast today has been compiled from multiple different sources. But the main two sources are a website called truity.com and also some parts from a book called Discover the Nine Types of People by Harper One. So here we go without further ado, 10 ways to spot in Enneagram Type 1, the perfectionist. So if you took the quiz last week, 
and last episode, excuse me, and you had mostly ones highlighted in that quiz, chances are you may be a type one perfectionist. So number one of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one. This is kind of a blurb about the type and also talks about the motivations and the fear. So Enneagram type ones like to do things correctly and they do things to really high standards. I know very closely an Enneagram type one and that is true for that person. Enneagram type ones are sticklers for rules and they pay very close attention to detail. They also avoid making mistakes, and to others, they appear perfectionistic, responsible, and super exact. Ones are typically sticklers for details and rules, and they get frustrated when things don't live up to those high, high standards, whether it be at work or relationships or in their day-to-day lives. So now, deepest fear which is the aforementioned fear and core motivation, one's fear being, quote, bad people, unquote, or just basically morally flawed or otherwise seen by others as imperfect. So they cope with this fear by being very rigid, by being super disciplined and super hard on themselves and They have pretty high expectations, too, of those around them. And, of course, these are generalizations, so nobody get upset, okay? Their core motivation is to be honorable and good and to live life with purpose. So they seek the best and most correct way to do things. Okay, number two of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist. Here are the key personality traits of the one. They're serious and straightforward during conversations. They're attuned to practicality and frugality. They're hardworking and diligent as employees. They have high internal standards. They're very rigid when it comes to plans and decisions. They have an intense ability to concentrate. They can get super hyper-focused. And they have a natural talent for teaching and instructing. And again, the person who I know very well who's a one would definitely fit those personality traits. Okay, number three of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one. The core values of an Enneagram One. All right, core values are a desire to improve every aspect of their lives. They aim for their actions to be consistent with their values and principles. And they work extremely hard to achieve that goal. Responsibility and due diligence are pillars of a perfectionist values. They strive for accountability and they appreciate the functionality of various products and systems. Integrity is a key factor in their life choices, and integrity stands the test of time with them. So therefore, loyalty, justice, and honesty are the core ingredients in shaping a perfectionist down-to-earth character. All right, number four of 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist. How to recognize one? How would you recognize an Enneagram type one out on the street, walking around? Well, generally they have a clear and organized life, both inside and out. It is the perfectionist's ultimate goal to be organized. They have a sense of steadfastness and diligence. And perfectionists seek to improve the state of the world through intention and reason. They have a clear sense of duty and feel obligated to serve society through willpower and perseverance. Very, very disciplined they are. Their method of communication is typically direct, honest, and deliberate. 
with little patience for small talk. They take charge of their duties in a contained manner. Fashion trends are of little concern. Yes, that's true for the person I know as well. They prefer to invest in high quality pieces that'll stand the test of time. And in relationships, they have a similar outlook. Ones are loyal, conscientious partners who also have high standards for not only themselves, but also their significant other, which can be difficult. With their keen ability to discern, they gravitate towards careers in the military, law, forensics, finance, and academia. Now, again, these are generalizations. That does not fit the person who I'm thinking of. But you can also find ones involved with nonprofits and civic or community focused organizations. Because really, ones long to make a positive impact and difference in the world and also in the workplace. They carry tasks carefully and methodically. And a perfectionist may be the star employee who goes above and beyond to complete all their work to a high standard. So, number five. Number five of 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist. When they are healthy and when they're not healthy. Okay. So when they're healthy, ones see an abundance of situations to improve and they accept the dynamic chaos of life just as it is. They have a strong sense of justice and fairness and they're willing to tolerate and understand the diversity of humanity to further progress for the greater good. The perfectionist achieves an ideal work-life balance and understands how to relax. That's when they're healthy, okay? When they're doing okay, when they're average, ones organize and compartmentalize all aspects of their lives. They follow strict ideals and are likely passionate about various social causes. This is evident in their professional or personal pursuits and societal memberships. Often, rigid workaholics, perfectionists may suppress emotional needs in order to get things done. And this I have seen many times. When they are unhealthy, ones become out of touch with reality and focused on complete and totally irrelevant factors. Now, this can lead to a self-affirming spiral of prejudice to the point of obsession and compulsion. They may discredit others' opinions and they may nitpick to keep their distorted self-image in check. Now, remember, these are generalizations, okay? There's little room for error in this state and perfectionists can fall into explosions of rage and fury. Fury or fury? Fury when their principles are under attack. So, for the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, number six, here are some growth tips for Enneagram number ones, the perfectionist. Be kinder to yourself. In the extreme or under stress, type ones can be so hard on themselves that they can make themselves miserable. Easing up on your inner negative critic is something to consider. Think about how a close friend would feel if you leveled that same critique at them. Not very good. Okay, and recognize that not everybody is where you are. Ones can be great colleagues, teachers, partners, and friends, but often their own high standards can make them seem judgmental. Yep, overly rigid and kind of harping on you. Learning to accept people as they are and to pause or at least censor yourself before getting overly preachy or nitpicky is very important. Be flexible and open to outside perspectives. Bringing moral clarity and strong principles to your work and life is great. And it has empowered many type ones who have led major social movements like Gandhi, for example, and Nelson Mandela. However, staying humble and grounded in living those truths versus just preaching them 
and understanding that people may bring other views to the table is critical to maintaining balance. Still on the growth tips, establish a healthy work-life balance. Ones tend to be driven workaholics with extraordinary focus, which can lead to a lot of career success as demonstrated by multiple type ones who have reached the heights of their own field. And so these are people like Michelle Obama and Captain Sullenberger, um, you know, of the Hudson, Miracle on the Hudson fame. But being mindful of the need to balance all these late office nights with time for relationships, family, health, and your overall wellness, that's like key right there. And lastly, for the growth tips is to lighten up. This may seem a little bit easier said than done, but the one's path to growth lies in learning to not take everything in life so seriously. Rule 62 for your 12-step followers, right? Don't take yourself too damn seriously. Look for the silliness in yourself and the world around you and take time to relax and be present. Okay, number seven of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist. See if you are a type one, if you identify with any of these celebrities, Martha Stewart, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Michelle Obama, Nelson Mandela, Tina Fey, Mahatma Gandhi, Captain Sully Sullenberger, Steve Jobs, Margaret Thatcher, Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Clinton, Meryl Streep, Elizabeth Warren, Kate Middleton, Brene Brown, Jane Fonda, Emma Watson, or Mary Poppins. (laughs) So if you or somebody you know identifies with those celebrities, perhaps you or they may be an Enneagram type one. All right, number eight. Number eight of 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist. As children, so keep in mind, maybe you used to be a one as a child and now you're different. Or maybe you have a child who is a one. Or maybe you've always been this way, who knows? Type ones as children generally criticize themselves in anticipation of criticism from others. And they generally refrain from doing things that they think might not come out perfect. They focus on living up to the expectations of their parents and teachers. Therefore, they're very responsible. They may actually assume the role of a parent and They may hold back negative emotions. Okay, so 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one. Number nine, type ones as parents, generally speaking, teach their children responsibility and strong moral values. And they're consistent and they're fair and they discipline firmly. And finally, number 10 of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist, is in relationships. Enneagram ones in a relationship can bring a balance of goodness, productivity, and fun to the mix that most of us can only dream about. However, ones also tend to focus on noticing errors in themselves and others. Because of this, When frustration rises to a high level in romantic relationships, ones internally point to the mistakes of their partners using logic. But they usually don't say anything about these critiques. This tension can cause a long-lasting, long-time frustration and resentment since they can tend to repress their anger and are sometimes even unaware of it. This repression stems from the belief that they are, quote, bad 
when they experience anger instead of realizing conflict is part of life. And by the way, this isn't true for everybody because you could have a wing and, well, we're going to get into all of that at the end after we go through all of the types. But when they do finally get the courage to express frustration to a partner or spouse, the spouse has often already felt the anger in some way or sensed it and can sense the one's critique or disapproval. And this can further a couple's polarization as the quite logical one refuses to meet the partner with understanding and softness. Instead, they insist on their own rigid posturing and being even more convinced that they are right. And this is super frustrating, by the way. (laughs) At this point, ones may express hostility since they believe their actions are correct and they will try to force things into conformity. For this reason, it is important for ones to practice the inner work of releasing their control and their desire for perfection to a higher power. Likewise, to ensure they are taking care of themselves through mindfulness, meditation, massage, self-care, working out, whatever it is. So when healthy ones recognize that the gift of rightness, fairness, and goodness they bring to the world is the source of their attraction, and that they are not responsible for the end result of every situation, including letting go to a higher power if they are spiritually inclined, they can relax in a relationship. Yay! That allows them to take better care of their relationship and offer apologies as necessary, the latter of which is not always natural for a one. If you love a one, remember that even when they're healthy, they still love improving things. Their biggest needs in the relationship are finding time to make the world a better place as a team and then to relax. This is not only their desire, but it is their gift. It is true. You too will be on the road to improvement if you choose to partner with a one. Sometimes that's even unconsciously why you pick them, because you knew they would keep you on the straight and narrow. Ones are in the anger triad of the Enneagram. We're going to talk about the triads, and this was part of the quiz in the last episode. We're going to talk about the triads, but we're going to put an asterisk by it and table it for the end after I've gone through the types. But basically, they are inclined to have anger and a harsh critical voice that can be turned both inward and outward. Like, for example, why aren't they better? Why aren't I better? They're often their own worst critic. Knowing this about them, you should encourage self-care and try to remember that when your one is trying to reform you, it's because they're wired to see problems and fix them. So if you work on your stuff and they work on their stuff, that's the best case scenario. However, don't take it on if it's not yours to deal with. Also, steer them toward fun as a reward after medium to large segments of hard relationship work. If you're with a one, remind them that you may have different gifts than they do. Let them know that you're never going to give up on self-improvement, but that you don't want them to judge or critique you. This, by the way, they do need lots of reminders on. Help them to understand that framing things more positively is super helpful. And realize that their very gift for seeing errors can be positive, but can also have a negative impact on you. So once, try not to take it personally because it's really, really detrimental if you do, but it's hard not to. For ones, finding balance can be a lifelong issue for them to work on 
in all their relationships. Finally, here's your bailout bag. So your bailout bag today, as always, take what you like and leave the rest. And I do hope you learned some things either about yourself, if you are an Enneagram type one, the perfectionist, or if you're in a relationship with a type one perfectionist, I hope you learned a few ways, 10 ways to spot them. Be kind, rewind, and thank you for the honor of your time. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.